best opportunity. Uh, actually, <clears throat> just one second. Is my screen visible? Okay. Yes, sir. Screen is visible, sir. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to share some uh, information on uh, GATE. The last time, I think I've taken in the wrong one. The last time we talked about the normal GATE, and uh, this time, before we come to the pathological gate, let us talk about how we <clears throat> actually see the gate, how we check it. What are the various ways and instruments for gate analysis? I tell you frankly that uh, most of the people find gate analysis to be very difficult and they also get confused when asking for equipment uh, from the uh, when they have to establish so this will give you some idea about what is essential and at what level what instrument can be useful so that is uh, what we are trying to cover Okay. Slide is oh. If you look at the slide that we projected last time, when people walk and you are trying to analyze the gate, it is so difficult to see what is happening at what phase of the gate cycle in the two legs, in the trunk, in the pelvis, or the upper extremity. In this video, I am deliberately not shown the upper part, uh, but in case you see, the events are very rapidly changing. And when they rapidly change, you have to keep that in the back of your mind and see uh, what is happening at what level. Heel stride, foot flat, swing phase, and Looking at one limb, you forget about the other limb. Looking at one joint, you forget about the other joint. While well, you have to see the simultaneously, rapidly changing sequence of events, which keeps on coming. So you have to find what is wrong in there. That is why we have to have some bit of instruments to check gait. So for the general gait parameters, you know that the one important thing is the number of steps per minute. So we can use the stopwatch. These uh, steps you can uh, count manually. And uh, most of these uh, smartwatches or the phones these days have uh, stopwatches. Previously, we used to spend about 3,000 rupees on a watch like this that you see. Later, the digital watches came and uh, things became a little easier. And uh, we can definitely see how many steps per minute without having any instrument in the present era. We normally ask the patient to walk about 20 meters and then check how many steps it, it takes in uh, one minute. Second general gait parameter is the stride length. So stride length, directly we can check in case we know what we used to do in case we don't have anything on the ground, like we can have chalk at one point of time or uh, some bit of white powder and uh, make the patient walk with the impression uh, made by the white powder stuck on the, uh, like we have a base of white powder, but we make the person stand there. Then we ask him to walk and when they walk, we measure how much was the step length, how much was the stride length. We can also make the person wet his uh, feet and then walk. But the trouble is with that, with color or with the wetness, you can have a slippery surface. So a patient can fall. And they also feel a little odd walking with instability. 
So this way you can get the information about step length, the walking base, toe angle, and the contact pattern. So this general gait parameter using chalk is one of the most uh, uh, used thing. Some people also use a black strip of uh, piece of uh, mat kind of a thing, which is spread on the ground and the chalk impression becomes very lasting. And we only used to do, you know, hold a chalk and mark the back of the heel on both the sides. When the patient was walking, we would walk behind and then mark it without having to have any kind of a measure. We just needed tape to do these measurements. Stride length indirectly can also be measured by the velocity and the number of steps uh, per minute. So it's not necessary that you take the, uh, you, you make the person walk 20 meters and see how much was the velocity, how much was the number of steps, and then you can check. Uh, so excuse velocity, me, sir. Yes. Uh, sir, slide is not changing, sir. It is not changing? No, sir. Okay. Sir, good evening, sir. Sir, slides are not changing, sir. Uh, even now it is not changing? No, it is in the first slide only. And oh. it is in the not in the slideshow mode. It is in the just uh, simple mode only. It's not in the slideshow mode. Let me do the sharing once again. I think you can scroll down and then you can see the following let slides. Me, let me do this sharing. Let me see new share. What is the sharing? I'll do the stop sharing and then and again start the sharing. Maybe something went wrong. Okay. Can you see the next slide now? Yeah. Okay. It's the next slide. Were you able to see the uh, video when I played it? Right now it is not playing, sir, but it is in no. the, yeah, no, it is no. playing now. No. Okay. No. Playing now. okay. You heard me to see, the, to say that I will repeat whatever I said on the slide uh, and briefly over here that the events are very rapidly yeah. changing when we do the gait analysis and we have to check both the legs, all the joints, the pelvis, the trunk, upper extremity, etc., cetera, et cetera. So everything with the naked eye, looking at different angles is not possible. That is why we need some method of gait analysis. So general gait parameters are the ones like cadence, number of steps per minute, we can use a stopwatch or we can uh, have the impression on the floor or on a mat with the feet either wet or on a chalk and the person walks and we can get these informations. And uh, in case uh, we also want to remotely calculate, we know the distance you know, the, and, and we check the cadence by timing it, we can also get the stride length indirectly. The velocity again uh, with how much velocity the person is walking. So the person walks 20 meters and in how much time then we convert them into meters per second. So we can do the this way by marking on the floor or a walkway. The timings can again be done, not manually, but we can also have switches on the foot which can be worn on the heel and the forefoot. Like as soon as we have the initial contact, as we say, most of the people have heel contact on the ground. So we can have a switch which activates a time. You know, this is the time the person puts the foot down. This is the time the person takes the foot off. Uh, so that way they can take the stance time and subsequent, as soon as they have the next contact, you can check how much time it takes for each step for the stride. So this gives us the information about the phases of the gait cycle. And we can also connect it to the computer or some kind of a recording device uh, where the timings can be taken. So this is how the foot switches are. So you have one uh, foot switch here and the one over here. So we fix it in the shoe itself. 
The trouble is that we need to have some wires, but we can also have the transmitter kind of a thing. So these foot switches can also be used for timing. In it, I mean, you don't have to really keep on clicking at the stopwatch in case uh, uh, you are not so much fast to do it. There are walkways which are instrumented. So as soon as you put your foot down, certain cells get activated and gives information on the uh, computer that uh, they have the contact. What is the size of the contact? What is the force? All this can also be taken into consideration. So it can also be uh, used similar to, uh, it can give similar information as a foot switch is given. Cables are not necessary here, as we saw on the previous slide down below that there are cables hanging, even though somebody walks along with the cables or uh, the transmissible cables. Uh, but uh, these foot uh, instrumented walkways are considered better from that point of view. However, they become very, very expensive and they are vulnerable for uh, losing the contacts because they need to have the sensors all along the uh, walkway and it becomes quite an expensive way to use this kind of an instrument. So instrumented walkways are like this. There's a long kind of a mat which has the connections underneath and the sensors underneath. The kinematics, the motion, most of us are deeply interested into how the motion is. So they work how we look at the motion. The most easier and the observational method is the clinical. And this is the most commonly used in the clinic because as the if we have trained eyes, we can look at the person, how the person is walking, and uh, we can take notes. The only thing we try to catch during this kind of a method is we look at a gross abnormalities and something which is very obvious to the eye. And from one observer to another observer, like we say, the eyes don't see what the mind doesn't know. So in case I know something and somebody else doesn't know something, or I don't know anything, I, uh, something and somebody else knows more than uh, me, so they will be able to get more information than I can get. So here we have documentation only in the head. We only have to write. And every time we write, we maybe a little bit of qualitative or the quantitative change can still be there. So there are a lot of inter-observer differences. And it is so complex that the minor changes happening in the gate are not discernible to us. So it is important, still important, to do this observational or the clinical method of gate analysis, which we use routinely in the OPD, we should not look at what is deficient, but at least some information is there. And it is very quick method to do it. Next comes the sequential still photograph. If you remember the very first time the gate analysis was done, they tried to look at the horses when they run and they were looking at how the horses can run better and what is the way they take their uh, jump off the ground and they used to have 30, 40 cameras with the strings attached and the horse will keep on breaking the strings and they will keep on clicking the photos in a sequential manner. So this is the basis of the sequential still photography and nowadays we have the burst images on our mobiles or the cameras that we can do it or the videos cameras. Uh, you can have the number of uh, images per second uh, in a very so, uh, small gap. So here we have the storage and retrieval of the images which are possible. The motion is not captured, but we can definitely have the sequence of the motion. So it is not complete. Or nowadays everybody has the phones and in case you put it at the right angle, to some extent you can catch hold of the uh, motion and you can edit that on the uh, video editing software. So everything, like in case you are doing still photography, it depends on the skill of the person, but it captures the uh, thing on a single plane. 
So like I say, in case uh, So in case we uh, say, uh, if I if you look at my elbow in this panel, and I, if I move it, you can't see how much is the angle. And in case you look at my elbow in this, in this plane, you can look how much is the angle. But in case I change the angle, you will not see if this is 90 here, and this may not appear 90 over here. This might appear something else. So single plane, we have difficulty. So we should uh, try not to uh, use only sequential still photography. Like for such a thing where it is not that very important, people do this kind of a split photography or for quick sports, they can do it. But uh, we have also tried to do it. Uh, this one of the papers we did in 1982 uh, when we were studying the gait pattern in uh, adult hemiplegic patients. And we could click the photo with a telescopic lens and all the phases of the gait cycle, like the initial contact, the foot flat, and the toe off, initial swing, terminal swing. We could check the angles of the ankle, the knee, and the hip, and we could project the graphs. And this way, still, we get some information without having any uh, sophisticated equipment or the video equipment, which was not that very common in those stages, those days. So it is about 43 years or 42 years old uh, thing. When we take the video, it definitely augments the clinical method. So you do the clinical uh, evaluation with the naked eye, but keep a record on the video so that you can play it back on the, on the screen and then uh, check how much is the difference. So you can see it repeatedly and you have it digitized in case you want to do it. You can store for one patient the sequences after the treatment, how the things are. Uh, but again, the trouble is that it records only in one plane and the angular differences will come. So this error of uh, shooting, as I was demonstrating to you, is one of the very bad thing that can happen. Most of the people I have seen, when they look, they hold the video right in front of their eyes and they are doing the thing on the ground and the person is walking in front. You don't ever see oh, what is the angle of the hip or the knee or the ankle. And this is one of the biggest mistakes I see in most of the people presenting papers. So this is this again has to know, uh, the person who is clicking has to know how the video is to be taken. Electrogoniometry is one of the very good methods that we can have uh, the goniometers fixed to the joint, which can give information either through the wires or telescope or through the telemetrically uh, onto the computer. So we can have the specific fixtures for each joint and we can have uh, one plane or three planes, whatever axis that we want. They can be rigid or flexible. So as I told you, wired or wireless. But measurements in different planes is possible with electrogoniometry. People don't try not to use electrogoniometry because in case it's a rigid kind of a thing, it causes a bit of impediment to the patient. So they walk a little awkwardly. So in case it's a flexible kind, still there is something fixed. You have tapes or something, some kind of a strap onto the ground and the person already feels a little restricted. So that is the disadvantage. So you have the flexible goniometers like this. We can check the uh, the information in uh, different uh, planes. So this is the way we have the interface. The patient can bear it on his back and the transmission can be done onto the computer where you can have the graphs come in. Next comes is the optoelectric scanners. So they use the prismatic reflectors with colored filters and scanners, and they can give you real 3D coordinates for kinematic analysis. This is one of the very accurate methods of optoelectric scanners, but this becomes rather expensive. So you have different kinds of uh, light thrown onto the person and uh, they scan how the things are going. The system which is considered the topmost is of course the television and the computer system. So what we do is we put markers onto the joint. Like for the hip joint, we have a trochanter. For the knee joint, we have the 
uh, epicondyle of the femur. For the ankle, we have the ball of the uh, fifth metatarsal, and we have the malleolus, and we have the heel, and we actually calibrate and do the angles in different phases, and we can say how much is the uh, capture rate that we want, 20 hertz, 50 hertz, 100 hertz, or for the sports kind of a thing, 200 hertz. So how much is the capability that we want? So we can have the strobe lights, we can eliminate those markers, and then we can capture on the cameras. And minimum, that marker must be visible at least on two cameras or more to have appropriate uh, angle. Like in case I say, uh, once again, my finger, you see here, you can't see the angle, but in case you see, you can see the angle. So in case a camera is looking at this angle, a camera is looking at this angle, and a camera is looking at this angle, they can resolve. We can do the calibration on the computer, and uh, we can have uh, the actual angle coming on the computer. So this is the best method, of course, uh, most popularly used. And uh, the marker systems can be like the reflection coming from the wherever you have put a marker, it can be active, like it can be light emit kind of a uh, marker, which becomes a little cumbersome. And you can have the strobe light falling on the marker and they reflect the light back onto the camera. And we can have the size smaller or the bigger, depending upon what kind of a camera and the distance that we are using. So they can be fixed onto the body using a double-sided tape and they are very easy. The only thing is that they tend to fall off, but it doesn't, it isn't that bad. In case you keep using, you, you rub the little alcohol on the skin and the hair are not that very, that many, and the person can easily uh, use that. So this is one of the very good uh, methods of uh, using the markers. You have to keep them clean, of course, so that the strobe light falling on it, it, uh, reflects it appropriately. So these are the retroreflective markers as we see it. Uh, we fix it like this and uh, the person, we can capture the gate in this way. So the television and computer system, of course, is one of the very accurate systems and it has a very high sampling rate as I was telling you. Normally we do about 20 Hertz or in very, very fast markers, 50 Hertz, and we can go up to 200 Hertz. So in case you're buying a machine, and you want to check a very rapidly running kind of a thing, or uh, you should have a sampling rate of at least 200 hertz. It's convenient to use and is useful for research and development, not for the sake of every day checking in the uh, OPD. In the OPD, I would say it is best that you use the clinical method, maybe use your mobile appropriately, not just like that. So television and computer system, or the marker system along with the force plate on the ground. So you have a walkway and you make the person stand, but without making him conscious how much, where the force plates are, you make the starting point and then you make the person start to walk and see that one foot falls on each other force plate at least once. So that is how we can have one complete stride and we can keep checking the angles at the same time, what was the phase of the gate and what is the pressure on the ground in the different phase that we can collaborate, corroborate on the computer and see the actual uh, thing in the actual way. One important thing is when we establish the gate lab, it is important to have two or three steps prior to the area where the person uh, we start to capture. Like in case the person starts here or he starts here, you should be able to have two or three steps so that the first or two, two or three steps, the person is not able to have the real gate. The starting time they are accelerating or they are trying to fall and they are trying to catch their balance. It is important to have a long walkway and you capture only two or three steps in between uh, to analyze. So motions can also be uh, captured. We need to have acceleration and rotation. So we need to have those motions also. For those things, we need to have the accelerometers. Accelerometers, as you 
understand is what's the velocity, what is the acceleration in case you are swinging your arm this way, that way. So how much, with what speed it is swinging, the foot is going in what direction, how the trunk is falling. So they measure the acceleration in one direction, but multiple units can be used so that you can see in all the three axes, X, Y, and Z axis. And different bodies uh, segments can be studied using the accelerometers. And uh, we, of course, you have the accelerometers in the uh, smartwatches these days as also in the smartphones. And this is one of the examples of having an accelerometer. You can fix it wherever you want. So number of accelerometers can be done. They can be wired or they can also be the transmitting kind of uh, accelerometer. So they are very small, smaller than a coin. Uh, which can be used. As you see here, it's just about five or six millimeters by two millimeters or one millimeter thick. So they can be uh, easily used. So this is one of the examples of the hand sensor kind of an accelerometer. You can do that with a sticky tape here and you have a wire or you don't have a wire. It all depends. So you know the body also moves in space. And we have the horizontal, vertical, and the transverse axis. So the speed gyros, uh, we, we can check the rate gyros uh, for measurement of angular velocity and the acceleration. To tell you frankly, the future of gait analysis is likely to be accelerometers and the gyroscopes. And a little, we will get information about the joint angles from them only by having a mixture of say one, uh, accelerometer in the forearm, one on the hand, one on the arm, and one on the thigh and leg, and they can check how the angles are going to be. So we can definitely, using trigonometric formulas, we can check the angles also. So the gyros can also be of different kinds, shapes, and these are the old pictures. Nowadays, the gyros which are there in the smart watches are hardly visible. They are sort of microscopic. The forces can be checked by various methods. One of the very simple method was that we have a glass floor and then we have a mirror underneath. On the top on the glass, the person will put his foot down and from the mirror, we can check how the information is there, how much is the contact, and we can check from underneath the surface how the pressures are, that is only qualitative. So we can use that either with a video camera or directly. We can also store and read the data, but accuracy naturally because we're using the naked eye and we are not doing the dynamic thing. And that is a little fallacious. Pedagography, of course, we uh, it is uh, very commonly used now. So we have an elastic mat over a glass plate or a video to store and retrieve the thing. And load cell systems in the mats, this is one of the most modern methods uh, to check the different parts of the foot, uh, how much the pressure is, and during different gait cycles, you can map it. And this can give a very good dynamic information. Storage and retrieval is possible. You can check specifically for giving the uh, undue pressure or uh, uneven pressure on the foot, and then you give a foot orthosis and check how things are uh, changing. So these uh, information can give you the line of progression and the weight, and this is how they look like. They can be smaller or bigger, and uh, diagram of uh, how the pressures are, how the peak pressures at a particular level in the gait cycle can be easily done. So they can... I'm sorry, any problem, anyone? Okay. No, sir. Please, please continue. Okay. So in shoe, we can also have the load cells. So how many load cells that you can put? Previously, they used to have just about two. Then they went on to four. Then eight was very common. Now we have 16, 32, 64 uh, load cells in one single device. We were working in IIT Delhi and we created our own insure device of having 64 load cells in one uh, insole. So they are fixed onto the insole and we can have a small number of wires coming like a ribbon uh, um, 
wire kind of a thing. So then we have a transmitter to give information on the store. So they can measure the general gate parameters and the forces, but wires in case they are there, they are very messy and make the person walk awkwardly. But uh, of course we have to do something. So insure devices, this is how the uh, ribbon cable is there and inside the shoe we have different uh, load cells and this is how the information comes. And we can also resolve in case we have one pressure here, one pressure here, how, how much would be the in-between pressure. So engineeringly, that can also be resolved. Force platforms are, of course, uh, the best. Uh, piezoelectric based are considered better than the strain gauze based. And they measure the ground reaction forces with the, like when the person puts his foot down, how much is the pressure, in what direction it comes, what is the peak, and we can integrate that with the uh, angle data or the kinematic data. So the kinetic and the kinematic information can also be done uh, on the computer very easily. So we have a phase of the gate cycle percentage wise or the event wise, and uh, we can also calculate the cadence velocity and the stride length, step length, everything. So force platforms, one, two, three, four, or the number of uh, usually minimum one is required, but two are considered better and you can have more. What muscle is acting at what level? Electromyography. So that is the other thing which is not done at many places. Uh, we can check the muscle activity, but not the type of contraction, like whether it is eccentric or the concentric kind of uh, contraction. So we can have the wired ones or the transmitting kind. But of course, wired even in the transmitting kind is essential. In the wired ones like they use in CNC alone, they have a bunch of wires hanging by the side of the patient. Somebody is holding onto the wires and walking behind the person and you can walk only at a, for a particular distance. In the transmitting kind, you have the wires and then we have a console which are connected onto the uh, back of the uh, person on a small transmitter, just like we have a wireless mic. So we that's a kind of uh, transmitter that we use. They are useful in uh, clinical decision making specifically for cerebral palsy or the patients who are uh, uh, having uh, muscle deficits. So it is very, very helpful in uh, functional electrical stimulation in case you are trying to work on that. And in case you have to do a muscle transfer, specifically in spastic patients, cerebral palsy patients, this kind of uh, electromyographic information is extremely important. So you can have number of channels, either wired or unwired. So you can have majorly the anti-gravity muscles in the lower extremity, or specifically in case you're looking at the transfer uh, of a muscle, then you can have more uh, uh, number of uh, sensors at the specific muscles. And they are extremely useful in uh, training the athletes and getting information. So here they are using the transmitting kind of uh, the thing, but the still small wires are there. The trouble is that the sensors that you electrodes that you have fitted, they come off with the sweat and uh, hair. The last thing about the gate analysis is the consumption of energy. So we have to actually check how much energy is being consumed by the patient, but we can't directly see how many calories a person is burning or how much oxygen the person is using. So we have to use different methods. One is heat output. We put the person in an insulated chamber and then we see how much heat is produced and indirectly we calculate this is the energy used by the person. In case we have the oxygen consumption, so we have a mask onto the patient, we do that on a completely closed uh, kind of a circuit and see how much oxygen is consumed. And indirectly, we do the mechanical calculation or the heart rate monitoring that can also be used. So this is the way that uh, in case we see the oxygen, how much is being used when the person is walking on a treadmill. Otherwise you have to have a cylinder at the back of the person like we used to do at Ames uh, for different kind of a thing. And the person walks with that. But the trouble is that the person will have to have such a big load and having a paraphernalia of a mask that too in a closed chamber 
the person might feel a little claustrophobic and uh, carrying extra weight for everybody, energy consumption is not possible. But you have to see, uh, depending upon in case you are doing some kind of research, you ought to see that. So what method you use, of course, depends on what is in need. Why do you want to do the gait analysis? The most important thing is, either we are doing for day-to-day -day basis, then the big lab is not necessary. You simply do clinical gait analysis, at the most do the general gait parameters. But in case you want to do research on prosthetics, orthotics, or you want to really do a very good job with the surgeries of uh, tendon transfers, you want to see whether it's the muscle which is problematic or the joint angle or there's a contracture and you are not able to discern it clinically, then of course uh, you go for the bigger things. But it all depends on whether you have space, you have the finance and you have the staff. Staffing is one of the big uh, problems. You need to have technical people. You need to spend a doc uh, expand a doctor to work on that. And uh, it, when I used to do it in England, I worked on uh, uh, different kinds of uh, prosthetic foot ankle mechanisms. I was trying to compare the two kinds using the uh, retroreflective markers, television computer system and the force plates. And it used to take five hours of analysis for one patient. And graphs and uh, interpretations, et cetera, that used to take another day. Nowadays, you can do the analysis in about two hours in case you want to do complete thing. The patient's time was approximately 35 to 40 minutes for one patient. In addition to having a patient be prepared, putting on the dress and then coming and bringing him onto the vault, onto the lab. So it takes a lot of time. You have to think whether you have people to work on that or not. So that is very, very important. So that is the end of... Uh, the first uh, part, would anybody like to ask any question uh, or should I go on to the next uh, topic? Okay. So consider, we'll take the questions at the end. I'll talk about the pathological gate now. Uh, Dr. Sodrup, uh, may I ask you something? Yes, that, sir. Uh, I actually intend to do uh, the thing at a very slow pace so that people can understand. Uh, giving the, the talk in 20 minutes and trying to finish up, people will not understand. It is okay in case we leave some part of it at the end and take up questions after uh, we do uh, another 15 or 20 minutes. Is it okay? Sir, sir, sir we will okay. finish it first. We will take the questions at the end. Uh, that is okay, but I don't think that uh, pathological gate can be done uh, in such a short period, whatever we have. Uh, like I said previously, we were looking at <laughs> doing sir, it. Today we don't have a restriction of time, sir. If we can exit for 10, 15 minutes, not an issue, sir. Okay, perfect, perfect. Thanks. Now, are we able to see the slide? Yes, sir. Okay. And uh, now we'll talk about the pathological gait. I'll go very slow, but uh, try to make you understand rather than simply cover it. The most important thing in gait analysis in pathological conditions is to understand that it is not a particular disease as a particular pattern. In different patients with a similar kind of a disease or illness, there are different patterns. Like very commonly uh, it, in the books or most of the people who teach gait, they say, what is hemiplegic gait? What is a spastic cerebral palsy gait? They will talk about this. And what is a, a vaulting gait and things like. I don't like to give names to these because I know after having worked deeply into gait analysis that each kind of an illness like hemiplegia has different kind of uh, patterns. So we should not type the gait according to the disease. If each individual with us or two individuals with the same disease or the same illness, they don't have a same pattern of gait. 
So please understand that. And those examiners who say, what is a hemiplegic gait pattern? I would like to differ in that. We can say that most of the patients with hemiplegia would have this kind of a thing, but there are a lot many variations and it is not a fixed pattern. We can generalize to some extent, but not really. In case you are very particular about gait analysis, you will not say that this is a particular kind of a disease pattern. So try to understand that. Cerebral palsy, about 80% of the patients have spastic cerebral palsy. And in case we look at the different types of uh, different places, what are the abnormalities? I will cover those kinds of things. Like in cerebral palsy, spastic patient, you look at the feet, the flat foot on the ground is there only about 10% of the patients. And toe-to-toe -to -toe gait pattern is there in the rest of the 90% gait pattern. And nobody had heel strike. We did study ourselves in, in uh, mid-80s at Ames. And we did about 250 patients of cerebral palsy. And none of those patients had heel-to-toe pattern. Specifically in case they had spastic, spasticity in the lower extremity. And scissoring, which is very common in patients with spastic cerebral palsy, which used to be like you make the patient hang by the uh, under the arms, holding the under arms, and they have scissoring in the legs. And when they walk, they walk like this. That was there in one third of the patients only. So not everybody has scissoring gait. That is one of the hallmarks. So we have to understand that. In spastic cerebral palsy, in case you look at the general gait parameters, the CADAS is low by about 50% of this, those children who walk uh, at that particular age. Velocity was very, very low by about 70%. And naturally, when the patient is having spasticity, their step length is low, the stride length is naturally reduced significantly. And children, of course, have a very smaller stride length and these step length as we discussed in the last one. In these cerebral palsy spastic lower extremities, if you look at the knee joint, the knee joint remains extended most of the times and less commonly they can be flexed in case it has not been tampered with or they don't have contractures. Those who start to stand or walk late, many develop contractures and they tend to have flexion but the spasticity makes the knee extended. How it happens, of course, you know that the stronger muscle will try to put the weaker muscle. In case we look at the knee joint, the quadriceps are stronger and the hamstrings are weaker muscles. So naturally, quadriceps will pull the knee into extension and many a times also cause recurvator. And when they tend to walk, the excursion of the knee joint to flex during the swing phase is reduced because they walk mostly with the uh, knee ex extension. When you look at this walking base, it is in, in case of the mixed type of uh, cerebral palsy, it is white. Like a toxic and athetoid mixed, it is different. It is variable in a toxic and athetoid because they will keep on having some balance and their walking base will go positive, negative, and they will not walk negatively or positively. So it is negative in spastic and variable in a toxic and athetoid and wider in mixed type. So in case somebody has spasticity along with ataxia, they will have a relatively wider uh, gait. Uh, it is not pure spastic that they will have a uh, negative gait. So in case you look at the hip and the trunk in cerebral palsy, spastic lower extremities, the hips most of the times has adduction attitude. Same principle in case you apply in the ankle, the gastrosoleus muscle is weaker. And in the hip, we have the uh, adductors stronger than the AB ductors and the internal rotators stronger than the external rotators. So that is how the limb tends to go into that kind of a attitude. The upper body movement in cerebral palsy is mostly absent because children would keep on having like this or 
some bit of uh, odd upper extremity depending upon how the thing is. And most of them would have flexed attitude of the upper extremity trying to balance out the lower extremities. So in case you look at the angles, so hip flexion is there and extension is significantly reduced if you look at it, this. And in case you look at the knee angles, it is not at the initial contact also, the knee is flexed and it remains flexed most of the times. And the excursion, if you look at the peak extension and the peak uh, peak extension and the peak flexion, there is a very small excursion of the knee joint. And here you look at only the plantar flexion is coming and the dorsiflexion is not coming at the uh, this is one or two patients we averaged out this chart taken from the book on gait analysis where the, from the lab where I was working in Negret. So in spastic cerebral palsy, in, in case you have done the TA lengthening, you tend to have a crouch gait, which, which means that the hips are flexed, knees are flexed, and the ankles are dorsiflexed. So you have to really take into consideration so many factors when you are trying to do muscle lengthening or you are trying to do the nerve, uh, uh, what is that, I think, crush the nerve, so neurectomies. So it has to be very, very guarded, very, very accurate. And you have to do more surgeries after the crouch gate. People tend to reduce down the uh, plantar flexion at the ankle and then they convert the patient into crouch gate. And the patients who have been walking on the toes they feel that a lot of energy is consumed when they walk on their fourth foot with the hips and the knee flexed. And energy consumption, you can understand how much more it will be. In Duchenne muscular dystrophy, we have plantar flexion, so you will have high stepage, provided the hip flexors are good. And the heel strike is absent, they will have four foot on the ground. And because uh, they are hips are weak, extensors are weak, there is more approximal weakness, they tend to have lordotic gait as one of the first uh, signs of uh, uh, abnormality in the gait. In the upper extremity, because the proximal muscles are weak, they will just hang by the side, they will have a lax attitude. It will not go along with when they take their foot till the time they can walk. Cadence is reduced, velocity is reduced, and the stride length is reduced because of the proximal muscle weakness. The hallmark of this is, of course, the lordotic gait and the plantar flexion. In Parkinsonism, in general, the person is having a flexed attitude as the way they stand. And they have freezing at the time of starting. And once they start, they tend to fall and try to have the, as if they are trying to catch the gravity. The cadence is increased, velocity is variable, and step length is significantly reduced. And the joint angle deviations are very, very reduced. Upper limb movements are also reduced. So they have shuffling gait most of the times, but these are the various features that you need to understand when you are talking of Parkinsonism. And as you've seen, most of the patients with the Parkinsonism will stand and walk like this with very, very short steps. And as if they are trying to fall and they are trying to shuffle their feet to catch the gravity. In peroneal muscular atrophy, you know that uh, dorsiflexor and the evolter weakness is there. So in case upper extremity, uh, I mean to say the proximal muscles like hip and knee are better, hip flexion would uh, compensate for the uh, preventing the toe drag. So they have a high stepage gain. The increased knee flexion is there during the swing phase because they also have to clear the ground so that the foot doesn't drag on the ground. Cadence is reduced, step length is reduced, velocity is reduced, and the heel strike is missing because they land on the lateral border of the foot initially or later on the, on the toes. So this is how peroneal muscular atrophy will look. In the below knee amputee, I'm not talking of the different types of prosthetic gates here. I'm talking of 
I mean to say abnormalities in the process. This is again a very large topic that what is wrong in the amputation uh, or the stump, what is wrong with the patient, what is wrong with the processes and what is wrong with the alignment. I'm not trying to cover that here. But those who have been fitted with a good process is in the baloney amputation, say a PTB, the foot flat is delayed because even if you give a quantum foot or you give a foot, multi-axial foot, when the person puts the foot down, the peroneae try to hold it and bring the foot to foot flat. Here we have a sag foot. We don't have an ankle joint which will move like this. It moves only slightly. So when the heel strike is there, the foot becomes very, very slowly uh, onto the ground because it is something like at 90 degrees. The heel strike is very early and the toe off is also early because the flexibility at the toe break is also reduced. The stance is smaller, not only because of the pain, but overall it is smaller. The knee flexion is low both in the stance and the swing phase. As you know, we have we reduce our height of the center of gravity's excursion by having a little bit of knee flexion during the stance phase. Here, it will be a function of how the stump is resting inside the socket and how the socket is aligned onto the rest of the processes. So the knee flexion in stance and swing phase is low. And in case we look at the cadence, strike length, velocity, hip ankle, angles, it is not at all disturbed in baloney amputee. And the center of gravity movement we checked, I did it in my study, it did not change uh, whether we use a kind of a foot like sag foot or a multi-axial foot or uni-axial foot. So many a times when we were studying, our bosses used to say that in military, those people who have been fitted with a good process is PTB, they you can't really see from a distance that uh, the person is having amputation unless you look at it very, very closely. So this study, uh, this is a graph I did in uh, England. And uh, if you see the hip angles, they are more or less fine. The knee angles are okay. They are not at all, not much different, but the ankle angles are reduced by one third, even though you had uh, multiple axials knee joint, but little bit of movement which comes with the satch foot or with the multi-axial, so that is only discernible. So it is not that different. In the above knee amputation, we have knee extension during stars. If you look at the normal person, as soon as a person puts the foot down, at the time of heel strike or the initial contact, the knee is fully extended. And as soon as you tend to go into foot flat, the knee tends to come into a bit of flexion so that the center of gravity doesn't rise that very much. Here, we don't have a quadriceps muscle. In the above knee, the knee is free. We only have friction to reduce down the rapid extension. So the person doesn't have any hold he uses his hip extensors to stabilize the knee and the knee has to remain in extension so that the person doesn't buckle or fall. So this is a very, very important thing to understand. That is why we don't have knee flexion during stance. It has to be extended. And we also shift the knee axis posteriorly so that the weight line passes in front. And as soon as the toe off is there, there is a very quick flexion because we have to work only at the hip level. And in the, in the uh, swing phase, there is a very rapid extension. It will fall. That is why we need to have some breaking mechanism or the friction mechanism in the knee joint. And there is a sudden stop on the heel contact. As the knee is extended, this has to be a jerky movement and the lever arm is so high uh, if there is no knee joint. So you have to move everything from the hip. A lot of effort comes from the hip. So in case we carry on, the swing phase is long. 
because the person has to throw the leg into the air using the hip and you have to use the mechanics of the knee joint. Cadence is low, stride length is more or less normal as we see, velocity is definitely low in these patients. So in case we continue to see their trunk on the top, there is a lateral trunk bending and the walking base becomes a little higher because they're trying to balance out of the thing. And the heel rise again is early and they have vaulting. Vaulting is the opposite, like, like this is the prosthetic leg and as it comes into the swing phase and uh, it tries to move, the leg is longer in case the knee extension we cannot control, the opposite foot has to go into uh, plantar flexion so that the person walks the toes and this foot raises as the plantar flexion happens on the opposite side. So that is called vaulting. That means the opposite side is compensating for the increase by increasing the height of the opposite limb to clear the prosthetic limb. And knee is kept in hyperextension to create the axis of the weight line posterior, uh, anterior to the knee joint so that the person doesn't buckle during the stance phase. So that is the mechanism inbuilt. So here, as you see, the hip angles are more or less okay. And the knee angle, you don't have any kind of a flexion. It is totally extended and you have the flexion only during the swing phase and stance phase, you don't have anything. And the ankle, of course, since you have put, usually put the uh, satch foot or whatever kind of a foot is there, unless you nowadays use the blades or the carbon foot, and only then they will have some kind of a movement here. The standard, whatever we use in our clinic, we hardly have any ankle joint movement. Very commonly asked question during polio by right, patient. The gait is not at all standard in patients with poliomyelitis. It is variable. And it all depends on which muscle is involved. Like in case you remember the last lecture, we were talking of the key muscles, hip extensors, hip flexors, knee extensors, knee flexors, ankle dorsiflexors, and ankle plantar flexors. These are the key muscles which keep the limb like a pillar when the person comes into stance phase. And which muscle comes into what part of gait cycle, you have to memorize that to find out what is wrong here. So, but most of the patients, when they keep on walking, they use trick movements and they adapt to the abnormal muscle power. And uh, they actually, in case you look at the initial phase in case somebody doesn't have tibialis interior, somebody doesn't have quadriceps, people can mimic those movements unless there is a contracture. And those people who already have contractures or deformities, there are additional deviations, not just because of the muscles, but the joint angles can be marred by having contractures or the deformities. And once a patient starts to use the uh, orthosis, again, it becomes uh, a little more uh, different for them. Now, common gates, in case we have, there are very, quite a few muscles in case you know that the quadriceps, uh, or sorry, the tibialis interior is the most common muscle. And the thinner muscle here is again the most common in the upper extremity which is involved. So tibialis interior, four foot landing. Tibialis interior, in case you imagine, this is the leg and this is the foot. The purpose is to dorsiflex and invert. As we, as a person walks in the swing phase, the purpose of the tibialis interior is to keep the foot up so that it doesn't drag on the ground. So this will have a foot drop and they will have a toe drag on the ground. Or in case there is a weakness, then the landing on the foot, like the heel strike to the flat foot, or the loading response would be slow down and they will have a slap on the ground. In case the cordyceps is weak, the person will tend to have buckling and to prevent buckling or falling, the person will put his hand above the knee. So hand to knee gait. 
But in case the hip extensors and the plantar flexors are good and they have power more than three, they may not try to use the hand to knee gate because it will be compensated by the uh, hip extensors and the plantar flexors. The gluteus medius, in case it is weak, the person will have Trendelenburg gait. That means to say that when the person is putting his foot on the affected side with the gluteus medius, the pelvis will dip onto the opposite side. In case the gluteus maximus is uh, involved, the person will try to compensate for balancing when the person is in the stance phase. As soon as he's coming into the stance phase, the hip will hold the person's uh, or the gluteus maximus will hold the hip into extension by contracting. In case that contraction is not there, the person will compensate by bending the trunk posteriorly and bringing the weight line behind the uh, hip joint. So other gait patterns are like shortening. In case the person has, they will uh, have it lateral trunk bending on that side and the pelvis will dip onto that side. The shoulder would also dip onto the shortening side. In case the gastrosoleus is uh, weak, the person will not have the lift from the ground. So the push off will be very weak or the person will take the foot just like that without having the heel off. They will simply go into the toe off. In case the balance interior is there, the whole foot will come off without having. So in case of cordyceps weakness, a person may have the hyperextension and the flexion may be uh, normal like that. So in case ankle dorsiflexion weakness is there, they will have a foot drop during the swing phase and they may have a toe drag. So they will have a high steppage gait with increased knee uh, flexion. So in case you have, uh, sorry, in case the opposite side has to lift to clear the ground, like somebody has a foot drop and the leg on this side, there is a, a kind of a deformity here that the person cannot clear and the hip is weak and the person is not able to do a high stepage, the person will raise his heel onto the other side to clear the ground so that it doesn't have a drag and he doesn't fall. So that is called a vaulting gait, which is again very common in case a person is wearing a prosthesis, specifically AK prosthesis and which is longer or the knee mechanism is not working appropriately to flex it. So in case the person has to stabilize the knee when they are walking, the knee axis is here and the weight line is passing posteriorly, the person will tend to fall backward. But in case of uh, poliomyelitis, when the cordyceps is weak, the person will tend to have a little forward bending to bring the weight line anterior to the knee axis so that the knee movements are into extension and the person doesn't collapse by having flexion. So in case of the hip, when I said that the, the gluteus maximus at the back is weak, it will not be able to stabilize the hip in flexion because here in case the hip is in flexion at the time of heel strike, the, quad, the gluteus maximus stabilizes the hip in extension. And once that extension is not there, the person will try to bend the knee. Like in case, uh, I will like to demonstrate. Like in case I am trying to put the hip like this and my trunk is bent like this, I will do hyperextension at the hip. As soon as I land, I will do this so that the weight line passes interior. Okay. Mm -hmm. So hip hiking is primarily compensating for the limb length and for the foot drop and also for the weak uh, in case you uh, can't bend the knee. In case of hemiplegia, this is uh, the information we have taken from our own uh, study which was published in Neurology India way back in the 80s. As I was telling, there was nothing like a hemiplegic gait. 
the gait pattern changes with the pattern of involvement in different patients in different stages. Like we did a number of uh, patients and we found that majority did not have heel strike. 50% had whole foot on the ground. It is not, some people had four foot or the toes first, which was about 30% and 15% patients landed on the lateral border. In case you go into the hemiplegia gate, they will say people land on the four foot only. So that is only 30%. So if you go by that, so it is variable. The toe drag is very common finding during the swing phase because of the reduced knee flexion, reduced hip flexion, and the plantar flexion, which is persistent. And 30% had circumduction. Circumduction is when the patient is having the normal limb in one side and the other limb is going, it will go round in circumductory fashion because the limb is short and the trunk muscles are also maybe spastic. They are not able to bend the knee to clear the ground of the foot dragging on the ground. So they do circumduction to compensate. They are not even able to raise their pelvis to clear the ground. So 30% had circumduction. 15% had Trendelenburg's gait pattern. So once the hip starts to reduce, uh, the, the, the weakness or uh, sparsity comes in, the Trendelenburg gait reduces down. That's only in a few patients. So in case there we see the stars in the swing, stars phase is definitely shorter on the affected side by 6% compared to the swing phase. Naturally, because the leg is weak, uh, maybe the kinesthetic feedback is also low, so they have very shorter stance phase. But on the other hand, the, on the unaffected side, the stance phase was longer by 20%. So you have a short stance on the affected side, but a longer stance on the unaffected side. The step length on the affected side was variable. It was increased by 25%, decreased in 30%, equal in 45%. Most of the people have, some people only have steps like this, one going forward and then stopping like this, or very few have equal kind of a thing. Some people only drag at the back. So this kind of gait you would have seen in the clinics. The important thing is keep observing patients for the different patterns as they come in and check what is being uh, seen in that. So looking at the pelvic movements, 50% of the patients had abnormal pelvic movements. Anterior pelvic tilt during swing phase, posterior pelvic tilt during stance phase, pelvic hiking during the swing and also pelvic rotations. So pelvis also moves quite a bit and most of the patients had this kind of a pattern. So you can understand why does this tilt occur primarily because of the spasticity and to clear the legs, they have to do the hiking as well as the tilt. So trunk and the upper extremity. Lateral trunk sway is very common on the affected side in about 20% and on the opposite direction in about 5%. So a few patients, one fifth, they were swaying onto the affected side and the upper extremity coordinated movements are absent on the affected side in almost most of the patients. In the kinematic analysis in hemiplegic patients, the hip excursions are moderately reduced. Knee angles are again reduced moderately because of this spasticity. Swing phase flexion is also reduced because the excursion of the knee joint is not happening. And genuine recovatum because of the spasticity as well as abnormal weights, it was coming. And in the initial phase when the patient is recovering, it is in the placid state and you make the person start to stand on that before the spasticity ensues, you are too early, genu recovatum is very common. Second thing is in case the ankle has not been taken into consideration, like you don't do the stretching of the gastrosoleus in the beginning and the person tends to have a uh, contracture of the angle, ankle in the plantar flexion 
and that also pushes the tibia backward to cause genorecurvatum. So this is a very common finding to have genorecurvatum in patients with hemiplegia. Ankle dorsiflexion is of course affected in the majority and we have persistent plantar flexion in the lower extremity. So this is the graph as we see the solid line is the normal and this is the range that we had dotted line for the patients with hemiplegia. So this is for the ankle, this is for the knee, and this is for the hip. So the angles are grossly reduced and they are subdued. And of course, I told, showed you that this is the method that we use. You see here the genu recurvatum also and persistent plantar flexion and the four foot, foot flat or the uh, landing on the ground. So circumduction gait is like, this is the unaffected side, this is the affected side, the person will go around the unaffected side. I think uh, I've covered the pathological gait. Okay. Talk is Thank over. You, sir. Yeah. Sir, thank you, sir. Welcome. So uh, we'll expect some questions from the participants. Uh, sure. Before uh, uh, getting any questions in the chat box, let us start discussion from my side, sir. Sure. Uh, 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 many centers, they don't have, even our center also, uh, have a good quality of uh, data analysis lab, or uh, uh, even not a single lab, even uh, many centers, they don't have a good lab. Still, uh, uh, in some cases, like uh, some musculoskeletal conditions like cerebral palsy or uh, amputee get, uh, we try to evaluate by observation get analysis or by simple uh, taking a uh, video on mobile camera of his set. Uh, so we try to elicit uh, the expected pathology, though it is not exactly so. Uh, many times, uh, especially for the CP, uh, CP patients, when we try to elicit that actually what is the, which is the jug muscle to be uh, handled by buttocks or by surgical means, especially when we are dealing with a knee flex, uh, flex knee, like in a crouch gate, as you said, uh, it's very difficult to say what the status of quadriceps because uh, the, the quadriceps uh, one is not adequate because Hamstrings are very much spastic and flex. That is associated with some uh, knee flexion contracture also. So, uh, whether to go for quadriceps augmentation or not, or simple to go for uh, hamstring, or sometimes we over by doing a uh, quadriceps augmentation because of lack of knowledge about this, uh, what is the status of quadriceps during instances. Same thing to the hip also. Uh, it, it is very difficult to assess the exact uh, power of the root uh, test the, which is very important for maintain the operating position. So uh, that's also sometimes confuses us that uh, because the reflexes are attacked and uh, the range is not complete. So it's very difficult to assess the exact power of the, uh, the uh, G-max. And if I'm doing performing any surgery around the knee joints without uh, having a proper G-max and that patient landing with a uh, standing with hip flexion. So these are the problems we are facing uh, while planning for surgery. So what do you take in that situation when we have a flexor or opposite group of muscles and we want the power and the stability of the other group of muscles like G-max against the hip flexors? How do you take on this? Actually, the thing is in case we have a complex situation which is not clear cut, it is very important to do a complete gait analysis including electrogonium, electromyography and the uh, joint angles and try to find out what is there. But in most of the patients, like routinely, you just want to see how the gait is in the beginning, whether there's a contracture or not, that you can check and how much is it, whether you need to give a brace. Uh, those patients, you don't need to do a complete uh, evaluation. And in case you start doing that, as I told you in the beginning, it will take a day for a patient. How much time do you have for a patient? Most of the times, for a cerebral palsy patient, you will spend half an hour, 45 minutes in the first time. 
and maybe 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes for the second time and not a whole day, unless you are really doing, trying to think of surgery. Like in um, CMC Velour, they do lots of surgery and they do lots and lots of gait analysis. Gait analysis in addition is being asked by the orthopedic surgeons, the neurologist and the people just for the sake of diagnosis or for the sake of uh, putting the evidence in the court, they are also asking for it. So it becomes a little odd, but for the sake of surgery or for the sake of developing a prosthetic or an orthotic device and testing it, gait analysis becomes extremely, extremely important. So where the particular muscles you want to transfer and whether that is actually acting, you are getting the contraction or not, that you can do that with the electromyography. That right, is right. extremely important. So that part we are missing, especially on what I was talking about, the G-Max. It's a very essential muscle for upright posture, uh, for hip stability. Right. And when the hip flexors are tight, it's very difficult to exactly assess what is the power exactly. of the gym yes. At that time, probably electromyography, the best method to assess is this is the muscle we can take off. added with right angles and the pressure, right. same thing is it. So we have a couple of can questions. We, can, yes, I will read the questions okay. from the top. Of course, the slides are uh, later visible. And uh, then, which is the latest technology that is minimally cumbersome? <laughs> Dr. Gogia has asked this question. Of course, I will always like to look at the retroreflective markers and the telemetric electromyography, at least 16 channel for the lower extremity uh, and or 32 channel for the upper extremity where the information would be too high. So that is the latest technology, but that is definitely cumbersome. In case you want to do for the routine cases, not for surgery or research, simple your mobile kept at an appropriate level and at a distance or a video camera is good enough. Because majority of the hospitals don't have adequate place even to examine patients. Why have, I mean, gate life is very, very difficult to investment of four crores or three crores of rupees nowadays is too much. We purchased gate analysis equipment in 19, uh, mid eighties and it was 50 lakhs at that time. And actually about four or five crores these days with the equivalent is uh, very, very hard. Uh, but in the future, I'm sure with the gyros, speed gyros and the accelerometers, everything would be done on the computer uh, using one simple camera. I have also seen a system which was developed using the, uh, uh, what do you have, the gaming consoles by Sony. What is that known as? Like you have a remote in the hand and uh, then right. you have a video camera and then you do that in the virtual reality. Uh, those cameras, they are used to resolve without putting any markers, the angles at the hip, knee and uh, ankle. And, uh, they were doing the thing. That is a futuristic thing, which I believe in two or one or two cameras, they were able to resolve most of the angles. That will come along with the accelerometers and the gyros. Next is, uh, can we have mixed gait in cerebral palsy? What is the overall percentage of mixed gait? In case you look at the cerebral palsy, 80% of the patients have spasticity and mixed are about eight to 10%. So in case you are looking at eight to 10% of the patients having mixed kind of cerebral palsy, spasticity associated with ataxia, cerebral palsy, spastic associated with athetoid. Athetoid and uh, spastic is the most common kind that I have seen. Uh, so you can say about eight to 8%, five to 8% patients would have a mixed kind of a gait. And in case you look at the athetoid, they would have a variable uh, gate, a variable base of the gate and uh, spasticity. And thank you, Dr. Taslimuddin. You have really encouraged me. Then again, Dr. Gogia, which is the latest technology. Okay. 
Ashish Makadan, the superb person who has been working in Vellor previously in the Gate Lab, and he was the one who introduced me to the Gate Lab. He says single limb stability percentage could be a surrogate of hip extensors and abductors. So that's a good information he has given. Okay, now Dr. Steffi Elsa is uh, asking in case of crouch gait or jump knee gait, where the child finds it difficult to have a better double limb sport, this method can't really be useful. I can't understand the question very well. In case of crouch gait or jump knee gait, where the child finds it difficult to have a better double limb sport, this method can't really be useful. Okay, single limb sport. He's, she is replying to Dr. McAdam. Okay. Dr. Gogi has said that the Sony thing is Xbox. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Gogi. Any more questions? Uh, so far, no more questions for chat box. Okay. Sir, sir this is something or uh, one question, sir, from my side, sir. Sure, sure. This, what is your experience on this, sir? Gate analysis on uh, this uh, uh, prosthetic element. Do you read? You, it's used uh, for this purpose, it's uh, used for the research purpose only, or for the uh, this uh, gate deviation, uh, sometimes it is required. Do you have any experience of using gate lab for the prosthetic uh, gate analysis? Actually, uh, the very first uh, project I did on the gate lab, because I wanted to learn the gate analysis when I went for the Commonwealth Fellowship, I was working in the Oxford Orthopedic Engineering Center which is the part of the Nuffield Orthopedic Center. So I worked on uh, prosthetic foot ankle mechanisms. At that particular moment, there was a shift from the uniaxial or the biaxial ankle joints, uh, which was less commonly used compared to the sash foot. They had developed a multi-axial uh, ankle joint. So we thought that maybe multi-axial ankle joint will give us more stability and better energy usage control and maybe some movement at the ankle. So I compared uh, patients wearing a below knee processes, uh, using a below knee processes with a stretch foot and a multi-axial foot separately or the persons who had sequentially used one and then went on to the multi-axial. And that was a type of research which we were trying to evaluate the foot ankle mechanism system. That system, as you see, is for research purposes to find out whether we have made something good, which is useful or not. On the other hand, in case I say, when we do the brace checkout clinic in the workshop, before we uh, give the processes a final touch, we try to see whether the person is walking normally or not. That time we don't use a gate lab. That time we use our naked eye, make a person walk towards you, away from you, from side to side. And uh, then we evaluate with the naked eye. So there we need to use our head, not the gate lab. Gate lab will not tell us whether the ankle is in uh, uh, lateral displacement or it is in a lateral angulation or the foot is too much anterior, or it is uh, more uh, dorsiflexed or plantar flexed. So these things you can see with the naked eye much better. Yes. Mostly it is for the research purpose, for research yes. development for uh, for new components, that's most useful. Yes. Okay, sir. And for the purpose of thesis, of course, in case you're trying to <laughs> <do something. laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, there is no more questions in the chat box. And uh, we are also completed more than one hour. So uh, before uh, coming to the end of this webinar, I would like to thank you very much, sir. Uh, when you are on the last for any help uh, for this webinar, you are always in forefront. And you never hesitate to teach your students. And uh, that's why you are the master of masters and teacher of teachers. <laughs> sir, keep blessing us. And uh, uh, whenever we require your help, Please extend your help in the Paramount Summit Academy support and your good lectures from your side. Uh, really, from my core of heart, I really thank you very much, sir. And uh, on behalf of uh, SB Nirka, as well as IAPMR Association, who is uh, wholeheartedly supporting us for organizing this webinar, uh, from all the side, I really uh, thank you very much, sir. And I must thank all the participants, participants who have joined this webinar, I hope. This talk is excellent talk and going back with some uh, some excellent knowledge on this uh, get analysis 
and uh, thank you very much sir and uh, i must thank the pr team also supporting us for this and i hope this uh, webinar will be uh, within two or three days it will be uploaded in the youtube if some of our friends um, uh, miss the uh, this uh, webinar they can again repeatedly see it and most of the graph may be difficult for the students also they can uh, read go through the book and uh, go through this presentation repeatedly watch the graph how it is happening how different kinetics and kinematics are occurring uh, through the graph and this is my suggestion for the students thank you again thank you very much sir uh, for uh, joining and presenting this sir you want to this say something last word i want to say that uh, it is very important to keep looking at the gate of all the patients that come to your clinic and uh, have that uh, you know stand by your consultant or the person who is more experienced second thing is there are hundreds of videos on the youtube about the gate and majority of them are all acted they are not real so don't rely so much on the youtube videos please thank right, you sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much.